Settling is not an option for me. Everything I desire is already mine. What if you can have it all? Because every day is for the girls. Hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode of For the Girls. I'm your host, Victoria Alario. And today we're talking about acne and gut health. We have an amazing guest, Maria Marlowe. Maria is a celebrity nutritionist who specializes in acne and the gut skin connection. Her entire brand is Glow by Marlowe, and she's the creator of Glow Biome Probiotics and the Clear Skin Plan, which is a 90 day program to help you improve your diet and lifestyle habits and clear your skin naturally. She gives Such amazing insight in this episode and so much detailed information that you girls are going to be so glad that you heard here. This is a value-packed interview that I know could help you girls on your wellness journey, so let's get right into it. Okay, everyone, welcome Maria to For the Girls. I'm so excited to have this chat. This is very different than most of our episodes. Maria, introduce yourself to the girls. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. My name is Maria Marlowe. I am a nutritionist specializing in acne. And um, yeah, I love talking all things food, nutrition, gut skin connection. So I'm excited to chat with you today. Yeah, I'm excited to like really get into it because I think that there's just so much that is unknown or that girls don't really like know or hear. So yeah, I think that this is going to be a really good one. More specifically, like you said, like with acne and whatnot, I have my own journey and I know that you do as well, which I want to talk about. I want to know what your journey was like and, and how really your interest with acne and nutrition all started. I did read on your website that you struggled with acne yourself. So How did you take that personal experience and then essentially turn it into your whole career? Yeah, well, I definitely don't think I'd be here if I didn't have acne, because that really was Mm -hmm. what inspired me and got me interested in this whole path. So I had acne for about five years from like high school into college, and I tried just about everything from the drugstore, topicals, to prescription medications. I was put on antibiotics, birth control, spironolactone, right? Like one thing, tried one thing, didn't work. Okay, move on to the next thing, didn't work. Okay, move on to the next thing. And I was eventually prescribed Accutane or isotretinoin. And I was actually excited to take it because I was like, okay, this is it. This is the the gold standard of acne medications. Maybe this will work. And I remember fulfilling the prescription And then I happened to, uh, you know, when you get a prescription, there's that piece of paper stapled to the Mm -hmm. front that has all the side effects. And one of the side effects was severe depression that could lead to suicide. And I was just like, wow, okay, that's pretty serious. And I was already depressed about my skin and all of the other medications I had tried didn't work. So I actually decided in that moment not to take it. And I just thought I was cursed. I thought I had bad genes or bad luck or bad skin. Something was not right because I was doing all the things I was told to do, but my skin wasn't clearing up. So fast forward, I end up meeting this girl in college who, you know, became a, became a friend and we were eating lunch one day and I was complaining about my skin. And she said very nonchalantly, she's like, Oh, maybe your acne is caused by what you're eating. And I almost spit my food out because I was like, that's like crazy. That's preposterous. I've been to so many dermatologists and not one of them have ever asked me what I was eating. And meanwhile, my lunch that day was like two slices of pizza, Entenmann's chocolate chip cookies and a (laughs) Coca-Cola. That was my lunch. Um, And anyway, I was so desperate. I was willing to try anything. She had recommended some things like she had grown up all organic and like her her parents were very different than mine. Anyway, uh, I changed my diet. And within about three months, my skin completely cleared up. And I was just like, wow, why doesn't anyone teach us this? Well, actually, to be honest with you, I didn't believe it was the food. I was like, there's just no way. I was like, this is a miracle. This is just coincidental. There's no way that the food changes actually worked. So I went back to eating, you know, my pizza and cookies and chips and all that stuff. And of course, my skin broke out again. So that second time, that is when I realized, okay, it is actually the food. And that's when I was like, okay, I want to learn everything that I can about nutrition and cooking. And I ended up completely changing career paths uh, to do so and really made it my mission to educate people um, about this skin and gut connection, skin and food connection, because there is actually a lot of science out there. And now in 2024, we're talking about it more 
than we were 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, Back then it was really like, no, there's no connection between food and skin. But now people are having a conversation. You're hearing about collagen and beauty supplements and all this stuff. Uh, But yeah, so I just, I really wanted to share this knowledge with people because I think it's so important. I know how it feels to have acne and to feel like every, like why isn't anything working for me? Mm -hmm. So just to really you know, give people a path to clearing their skin holistically. It is, first of all, you already hit the nail on the head from the beginning when you said like you were already depressed about your acne. Like it is really hard on especially young girls. I'm sure men as well, but I know young girls who already kind of struggle with insecurity and the comparison game and all that. And then when you are in college, and and I also I very much always struggled with acne. I have very acne prone skin. I only started really healing my skin about two years ago, I would say prior to now, like I have no makeup on right now prior to now, my skin would be like covered in pimples right now. And, um, you know, when you're especially in college, I at that same time, I also had acne and whatnot. A lot of the girls have such youthful like baby skin just that soft skin and you're looking around at all the girls and you're like what am I doing wrong like how how do these girls sleep in their makeup on a Friday night and they still wake up with this like porcelain skin so to begin with it is it is depressing like it's very hard on on young girls mental health and so similar to you I never actually ended up being prescribed Accutane, I never actually like got the bottle in my hands, but four separate times I began the process like doing the blood work, going on the birth control, taking the pregnancy test, like all the like the steps that you have to do beforehand. I did that four different times because every single time I backed away and I was like, I don't know, I just feel like there's got to be another way. And luckily, you know, luckily there was, but then, uh, you know, you give up hope. And I'm like, let me just try it. Let me just try it. And now today, I'm like, I'm so glad that I never went on that. But you did mention the spironolactone, which I did go on. And I recently came off of it like a few months ago, I I stopped using it because I felt like, let me see, let me just see like if I'm not going to need it. And it just goes to show that I don't because my skin did not like I, I didn't start to flare up and break out after I got off of it. But I, I am curious before we go on to our other questions about is that one, like how bad is spironolactone for you? I I feel like a lot of people are starting to go on that rather than Accutane because it's like a less severe medication. But is it like, tell tell me a little bit more about it. Well, spironolactone is not like primarily an acne medication the way that say Accutane is prescribed specifically for acne. Um, so with any drug, there are side effects and there's varying side effects. So they don't seem to be as serious as say Accutane because Accutane has a whole list of very serious side effects from, you know, starting with the benign, like just dry skin, dry lips, dry eyes, like going to severe gut and liver damage, going Uh to that, you know, suicidal ideation. So I would say Accutane is does have have a much more <laughs> harsh side effects. It doesn't mean everyone is going to get them. Uh, I definitely know plenty of people who've been on Accutane and their skin is clear and they're really happy that they did it. And you know, everything's all good. Mm-hmm. But I do also know other people who went on it and had to go on multiple rounds of it and their skin didn't ultimately clear like or it cleared for a period of time and kept coming back. I know people who have repercussions do you have like that gut damage, do you have the liver damage, um, you know, do you have different issues? So uh, I had one friend who did have the suicidal thoughts and her friend had to like, or her cousin rather, had to like talk her off of <clears throat> doing something, you know, jumping off of her balcony, which is is really scary. And, and mm-hmm. you know, you hear these stories in the news every once in a while about something like that happening. And I just feel that, you know, especially like for teenagers, like, I I just think there's a better way. I don't think it's worth the risk, even if it's, you know, one in a million, one in a bill, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Because if it's you or your daughter or your friend or your cousin, that's all that matters. So Mm -hmm. um, I would say, yeah, spironolactone definitely has less risk. um, But it still has its own host of risks as as does any medication. Yeah, yeah. Now you have Glow by Marlo. This is your brand. This is your business. Isn't it funny, though, how you mentioned like just 
you had a friend in college that kind of like inspired essentially like you to launch this thing. Like, are you guys still friends? Does she like know and follow your no. whole journey? <laughs> no, to, like I don't know. Like, uh-huh. It's so crazy because at the point, right? I didn't obviously know what was going to transpire all these years down the line. And it didn't happen like right away. You know what I mean? Like first I had to like make the changes and then do it. And then I'm like, do I change careers? And then I was like, okay, yes. So it took some time, but yeah, uh, yeah, it is kind of crazy how that like one conversation completely changed the trajectory of my life. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us more about that then. So what does glow, what do you offer in this (laughs) whole program really? Yeah, so um, with Glow by Marlo, that's the, kind of the name of my website and my some of my social media, like my TikTok. Um, and I provide a lot of recipes and information for people on how to clear their skin naturally and holistically. I also offer something called the Clear Skin Plan, which mm-hmm. is really based on, you know, over a decade of working with people um, and uh, doing research on the connection between acne and skin, uh, sorry, and, and food, acne and gut health. And it's really a a step-by-step guide to clearing your skin holistically and naturally by getting to the root cause. So what I found in my research is that there's really six primary root causes of acne, nutrient deficiencies, gut dysbiosis, a pro-inflammatory diet, stress, hormonal imbalances, and overly harsh skincare. And five out of those, everything except the skincare is influenced by our diet. Even if you have a hormonal imbalance or hormonal acne, it's not just the hormones. It's also uh, heavily influenced by your diet, your gut health, your lifestyle, your stress. So um, I really feel that diet and lifestyle is the best way and actually surprisingly the fastest way to, to clear your skin because when you get to the root of the issue, that's when you can, you know, finally solve the problem. Yeah, yeah. So I want you to break this down then into like the easiest terms for listeners to understand what the actual connection is between the gut, brain, skin. How how do these three actually connect? And why does that all really like make this sort of difference on the surface? Like this is internal stuff. So how do, how does it actually turn into seeing it? Yeah, so the gut, the brain, and the skin, these three organs are intricately connected. So they're always in communication and it's a two-way communication. So what's happening in one of these organs is affecting the other organs. And it was about or almost 100 years ago that there were two dermatologists, John H. Stokes and Donald M. Pillsbury, who were doing research on acne and the connection between stress and acne and the gut and acne. And they sort of laid the framework for what we now call the gut brain skin axis or the gut brain skin connection. And what they noticed was that their acne patients tended to be more stressed and anxious than some of their other patients. And they hypothesized that maybe there was something going on there that the stress was somehow affecting their skin. So they did some studies and, you know, what they, what they came up with or their hypothesis was that stressful thoughts such as fear, anger, worry, doubt, any of that kind of stuff, sadness, depression, that it would actually create changes in the gut. And those changes would create inflammation that would show up on the skin. And they were actually some of the first to start experimenting with using probiotics as a way to clear the skin. Now, back then they weren't called probiotics, but they were using lacto-fermented foods like with L-acidophilus to see if that could improve, you know, their patients' outcomes. And they did find, I think it was like 80% of the patients had improvement after adding these foods into their diet. They also noticed that their acne patients tended to be constipated which um, the probiotics can help with, but also eating a fiber rich diet that can help with as well. So yeah, so basically what we know now in the decades since more and more studies have kind of elucidated on this virginal hypothesis that they had. And we have seen that, yes, stress can actually trigger breakouts. There have been a few different studies that looked at um, like students before an exam or you know, a a group of people before a stressful situation. And they found that they, they indeed their skin broke out more when they were under stress than when they weren't. And part of it is that gut 
skin connection with the, the stress disrupting the gut, creating the inflammation and ending up on the skin. But it's also that stress increases our cortisol and cortisol can increase our sebum production. So it actually make your skin more oily and more prone to breakouts. Um, so, so stress, there's definitely a stress and acne link. And we also know for other inflammatory skin disorders, like, um, psoriasis, eczema, rosacea, we know that stress can actually sometimes trigger this stress can trigger cold sores, right? We know that there is some connection between the stress and the skin with different skin uh, disorders. Now with the gut section, so yes, stressful thoughts can disrupt your gut and actually wipe out some of the good bacteria that have anti-inflammatory properties, but also certain foods can have that same effect. And if we're eating a high sugar, very processed diet, if we're not eating enough fiber, all of these things can contribute to gut dysbiosis. And when we have this disruption in our gut microbiome, again, when we're kind of, when we lack those good bacteria, like the lactobacillus and bifidobacteria that have anti-inflammatory benefits, then the more opportunistic bacteria have space to kind of overgrow and create problems, create inflammation and create other issues. So because everything in our body is connected, the inflammation that starts in the gut, it doesn't just stay there. It ends up body wide and ends up on our skin. So even, you know, the, that's why the foods that we eat can also, um, you know, trigger acne as well. So uh, it's, it's really, really fascinating, but stress <laughs> and your diet can absolutely break you out. And that's why, like, if you're like, I'm using all these topicals and my skin keeps breaking out, it's because it's not really a topical issue, you know? Mm -hmm it's, it's coming internally. If you have acne, that's just chronic and it's keeps coming back and back and back. It's not a topical issue. It's really an internal issue and you'll get a lot further by getting to that root cause. Yeah. I mean, it, it does make perfect sense. I was prescribed so many different topicals. I, I really essentially stopped seeing dermatologists altogether a long time ago. But when, you know, when you're younger, you're not as educated, you don't even know what's really out there as far as estheticians or, you know, nutritionists, like, just anybody who really works on the skin more holistically, as opposed to <laughs> like a doctor just wanted to slap on something so you could stop coming back and asking the same question. I don't, I don't know exactly what it is, but at least I know that like they didn't really go as far to look in any other way for, for me, at least in my experience, it was just like, Oh, this looks like this, this looks like that. So let's put you on, you know, I went on all the mycins, the clindamycins and the, this mycin and that, and you know, the tretinoins and the retinoins and all what the heck these things are called. <laughs> and you know, nothing, nothing ever helped me. Like nothing ever made a difference on my skin. Um, one thing that I started to do actually a while back, which I think was a smart thing, at least for me was to, I did, um, like an allergy test, like a stool sample and all that. And I did that. And that was cool. Like that was helpful. So I, I actually did start to see differences from the food. But what I will say is like, when you're in that, like, rat race of like trying to figure out what's wrong, the stress that comes from just every single day, looking in the mirror and observing the skin to see like, is it better? Is it worse? Am I more inflamed? Is it flat? Like, I think that was making it even so much more worse because I was so hyper fixated on my skin that I I feel like that's all I, I was thinking about. And then what happens after that? Then you're touching it, then you're making it more inflamed. Like when everything is so fixated on healing your skin, I think that that makes things just that much more worse because of the fact that you're having all of this unnecessary stress which then one le thing leads to another, exactly like you just said. Yeah, it's kind of like an unfortunate little hamster wheel because yeah. we get the acne and then we're stressed about the acne and then the stress creates more acne. Yeah. But I like to have like, I call it like my emergency breakout plan. So there's a mm. few things that could help in these situations. So one is adding some flaxseed to your diet. So whenever we break out, typically, the first thing you think of is, okay, what can I put on my skin, right? But I encourage people to start experimenting with what you put in your body and mm. see what has better results. So with flaxseed, this was honestly like my skin superfood savior when I had really bad acne, because it's really high in omega-3. 
plant-based omega-3s, which have anti-inflammatory properties. And if you think about what acne is, it's inflammation of the skin, right? It's a red raised bump. And so the omega-3 from the flaxseed is going to help to bring down some of that redness, bring down that inflammation. Um, it's also a good source of fiber and fiber is really helpful for elimination. So I kind of mentioned before those two dermatologists, they saw this link between constipation and acne. And now again, in the decades since, there are a number of studies that have linked a, um, like a disrupted gut microbiome with acne and acne patients tend to lack the lactobacillus and bifidobacteria strains, which tend to keep you more regular. Um, and so it is really important if you have acne, like just in general, make sure you're going every day maybe twice a day. That's kind of ideal. That's the goal to go for. Uh, it should be easy to go um, well formed like that is the goal. And if you work on getting there through your diet, like you'll definitely notice a big change in your skin. So anyway, I went off tangent, but flaxseed. So that's part of the emergency bike, uh, breakout plan. Add about a tablespoon of ground flaxseed to whatever you're eating that day. You can put it in a smoothie. You can put it on top of a salad. You can put it on top of whatever you're eating. It just adds this nice like little nutty flavor. Another thing you can do just in general is I would avoid the sugar that day, the sugar, the refined carbs, and go for anti-inflammatory foods like berries, dark leafy greens, wild salmon, add turmeric to, to whatever you're cooking, maybe make a ginger tea, right? Um, there are so many delicious anti-inflammatory foods that are really, really powerful for, again, for reducing that inflammation from inside. So I actually have this three-day clear skin starter kit on my site, uh, which is totally free but it's got three days of recipes that will help you see the difference of how food can actually change your skin in just three days. So it's not going to completely clear your face and you're not going to be free of acne in three days, but you will see a difference. You'll see a reduction in redness, a reduction in bumps, a reduction in breakouts. Um, and I think, yeah, doing that experiment and kind of like taking a photo beforehand and then afterhand for you to see that, uh, you know, firsthand, I think that also is very inspiring and encouraging to kind of keep going with it and keep, you know, experimenting with food. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, there's nothing like finally seeing the change. There's nothing like finally seeing the difference. I, the one thing that uh, is like sticking out to me about how you mentioned the flaxseed is, am I going crazy or are people doing this in a mask on their face? Yes, these days? it's a viral Okay, I like mask. that's happening, right? So I tried this. I actually tried it the other day. <clears throat> I don't know if it's Botox. They're saying like, oh, this flaxseed mask is Botox. But like, I didn't see any, uh, you know, any results. I only did it once, but I didn't see any results in terms of like fine lines or anything like that. Um, but I, it definitely makes your skin softer and more hydrated because all those essential fatty acids, um, I feel like it exfoliates kind of nicely, like gently. So people are using it on their face, but it's also really beneficial to eat it. Okay, because as you said it, I'm like, wait, I feel like I just uh, like heard of this. Okay, so flax seeds. All right, good. Between that, there's been so many different things that have gone viral that may be a little bit of like a placebo effect. Like, I don't know if people are actually seeing the results that they're talking about or if they're just convincing themselves. I feel like there's a lot of myths out there. What are some of like the main myths or are there any myths that really stand out to you that you feel like you've busted that you have discovered to not be accurate? Yeah, well, I would say the biggest myth about acne is that it's caused by bacteria. It's not, it's caused by inflammation. So the idea that acne was or is caused by bacteria dates back to the 1950s. And during that time, that was the prevailing hypothesis based on the research at that time. And that is why uh, antibiotics were started to be, they were started to be prescribed for acne. Now, fast forward to the 1980s. During this time period, research started to kind of poke holes in this acne causing bacteria hypothesis. So what the researchers had initially found back like in the 50s was that um, acne patients had a bacteria on their skin called P. acnes. And um, they thought that this was the acne causing bacteria and they thought this was the problem. And that's why they wanted to go after it with antibiotics, which makes sense. But during the 80s, 
Other research started to point to inflammation as the primary root cause. And in the next couple of decades, we had various studies that kind of kept pointing the figure, finger more at inflammation than bacteria. So for example, we found out that that bacteria that they thought was causing acne, it's actually a commensal or good bacteria that's found on clear and healthy skin, often in equal amounts as those with acne. Secondly, we found that people who have acne, you can have acne breakouts without having this particular bacteria on your skin. So those are two indicators that bacteria, that this bacteria is not really the primary cause. Now, bacteria may play some role in acne, but it's not the first domino that sets off the rest of the chain of events. It's really inflammation, inflammation in the body. And I think in the coming decades, because it takes time from study to like actually be put into practice, but what you're going to start to see is more of a focus on inflammation. And we're already seeing that because in the early 2010s, acne was reclassified from a bacterial infection to an inflammatory skin disorder. So if you look up what is acne now, it's classified as an inflammatory skin disorder. Mm. The problem or like the crazy thing is that even though we now understand that inflammation is the primary trigger, we're still treating acne as if it's a bacterial infection. We're still prescribing antibiotics. They're the most commonly prescribed drug for acne. And that is really an issue. Um, and so really, I think what's going to start to happen is that, especially because antibiotics, we know that long-term antibiotics are not great. Um, it increases our risk of antibiotic resistant bacteria, increases the risk of, you know, developing pretty severe infections like a C. difficile infection, which could end you up in the hospital. And so antibiotics serve uh, a role and they are, you know, absolutely necessary for certain things. But for acne, in my opinion, it's not the right time or place for antibiotics. And there are better solutions that are going to target that inflammation specifically. And I will add that kind of in retrospect, the class of antibiotics that's used for acne, it also has anti-inflammatory properties. So in retrospect, it seems that really the main benefit that people are getting from the antibiotics in terms of it clearing their skin may actually be the anti-inflammatory benefits mm. versus the antibacterial benefits. And that's why when they go off the antibiotics, it often relapses. So anyway, long story short, inflammation <laughs> is really the cause of acne. And I think in the future, you may see anti-inflammatory drugs being prescribed for acne. And uh, I think it's definitely a move in the right direction. But that said, our diet and our lifestyle are the two most powerful levers we have over the inflammation in our body. They're effective. They only have positive side effects and they actually work quicker than you'd think. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's why there's so many like de bloating and anti inflammatory new like gimmicky things out there when realistically, like you could go the holistic, you know, more natural route and just eat anti inflammatory foods. So what would you say are the best foods for that? What if if somebody were to like want to start from scratch, they, they listen to this episode and they're like, all right, I want to start tomorrow. What should their diet really be made up of? And there's also a second part to this question. Does that change if your acne is like hormonal acne or stress acne? Like, is it all the same thing? Like, is like the inflammation really like the main thing, no matter what your acne is kind of like stemming from? So there are various, like, first of all, many different causes of inflammation. Like it could be mm -hmm. a nutrient deficiency. It could be eating pro-inflammatory foods. It could be stress, right? So there are these different sources of inflammation. So it's a matter of figuring out what your sources of inflammation gotcha. are and then working on those. So for example, vitamin A, this is a deficiency that's common amongst acne patients. And research shows that typically the worse the, uh, the, worse the deficiency of vitamin A, the worse the severity of acne. Now, if you have acne and you have a vitamin A deficiency as shown through your blood work, then adding vitamin A back into your diet 
should show improvement. But if you have acne and you don't have a vitamin A deficiency, then adding vitamin A is not going to do anything for you. Mm, Sorry, do you have to figure out what your, if you, if, is it a different deficiency? Is it something you're eating? Is it something, you know, maybe you have a food sensitivity and that's creating inflammation or whatever the case is. So you have to, you do need to figure out what your issue is. I will say there are some general guidelines that I think kind of work across the board, no matter what type of acne you have. But then, yes, there are some specific nuances, like if you have hormonal acne or what kind of hormonal acne, or if you have stress mm. acne or whatever the case is, there are some, some yeah. nuances. So there are really three things, three key things. Like if you're starting from scratch, this is what I would focus on. Number one, fill half of your plate with vegetables, at least two meals a day. So your lunch and your dinner, make 50% of your plate veggies. They could be cooked. They could be raw. It doesn't matter. It could be any veggie that you want. Just eat the rainbow. Just start eating more vegetables, more fiber. Vegetables are like nature's multivitamins, particularly our dark leafy greens, like kale, chard, collard greens, spinach, broccoli, etc. And also, so I'd say dark leafy greens and orange fruits and vegetables, things like butternut squash, carrots, uh, sweet potatoes. These are particularly beneficial for acne prone skin because they are rich in nutrients that acne patients are typically lacking, like the vitamin A, which comes from beta carotene. Um, they also contain, you know, various minerals. So it's really important that we're eating our vegetables and we're eating enough vegetables. Most people are not eating enough. So they're missing out on the nutrients and they're also missing out on the fiber. The fiber is what's going to keep you regular and make sure that you are going every single day that you're not constipated because again, constipation is a big issue. And I will say if you have hormonal acne, so the way that our body gets rid of excess hormones is that they are sent to the liver where the liver breaks them down and then they're packaged up in the stool to be excreted. If you're constipated, then if your liver breaks the hormones down and they're sitting in your gut, if you're constipated, those excess hormones can actually get absorbed back into your bloodstream, contributing to imbalance. So that's why I say, even with hormonal acne, your diet does matter because if you're not eating enough fiber, that can contribute to hormonal imbalance. And studies do show that with hormonal imbalances, adding enough fiber into the diet can actually help bring you back into balance. So yeah, number one, make sure you're eating enough fiber, eat the rainbow vegetables with a little emphasis on your greens and your oranges. Don't only eat green and orange vegetables, but definitely try to get them in daily. So that's number one. Number two, get enough protein. So a lot of people, this was myself included, are hooked on sugar. And some people, yes, are eating sweet things, desserts, cookies, candies, cake, like that was definitely me. But there's some people who are like, I don't eat sweet foods at all. Like I actually eat pretty healthy. Like how can I have any issues with blood sugar? Well, if you're eating oatmeal for breakfast, a sandwich for lunch, even if it's on whole wheat bread, you're having, maybe you're even having like some, a cup of pineapple for, for like a snack in between meals, or you're having crackers or pretzels or something. And then for dinner, I don't know, you're having like a big rice bowl or pasta or something. So even though you're eating savory foods, some of these foods are higher glycemic, particularly if you're not pairing them with fiber, protein, and fats. And so they can still spike your blood sugar. And we know from the research that a high glycemic low diet, one that spikes your blood sugar often, is associated with an increased risk of acne. And when you switch someone who's on a high glycemic low diet to a low glycemic low diet, their acne decreases. So there was a study, I think it was in Miami, there was about 3000 participants and they put them on a low glycemic low diet for 12 weeks. And I want to say it's about 90% of the participants had a reduction of their acne within 12 weeks, 90%. Imagine that there's no acne drug that 90% mm -hmm. of the people who take it, no. their acne is reduced. So that was, uh, so moving to a low glycemic low diet is very, very powerful. And one way to do that, especially if you do feel like you are addicted to sugar or you're addicted to carbs is to simply add more protein. in. when you add more protein into your diet, you don't need willpower because you're just not going to want the sugar and the carbs as much over time. So what that looks like is, or a good sort of 
goal post is to aim for about 30 grams of protein per meal. You know, you can kind of plus or minus. It's going to also depend on, you know, your height, your weight, your activity level, all of that stuff. But it's kind of like a good, a good goal post. And when you do that, especially for breakfast, that is going to set you up to minimize sugar cravings, to feel satiated, to not feel like the need to stack, snack during the day. Um, and you're just going to feel better. Like you're probably your mood will be better, more even keeled, uh, less brain fog, all of that. And by the way, eating enough protein also helps with our hair, thicker, fuller hair. It helps with our nails that are long and strong and don't break. So protein has a lot of beauty benefits. It's also um, great for skin repair. So even though we shouldn't be picking at our skin, I know sometimes it happens. I'm guilty of it as well. You don't want it to scar. You want it to heal properly. And eating enough protein can actually help with that um, and eating anti-inflammatory foods. So yeah, so my second thing would be make sure you're getting enough protein at every meal and aim for about 30 grams of protein. That's going to help to keep your blood sugar more stable. And I'll kind of like tack on there. Yeah, if you can minimize the, the sweet foods and the high, the refined carbohydrate foods, that would be ideal. You don't have to, uh, you know, minimize your whole carbohydrates. So your brown rice, your sweet potatoes, your fruit, and things like that. It's just you want to eat them as part of a complete meal with fiber, protein, and fat. And it'll keep your blood sugar stable. That's number two. And then number three, I would say, is to support your liver. So for a lot of people, the liver becomes just overburdened because we are living very fast paced, hectic, high stress lives with a lot of exposure to different chemicals and environmental pollutants. And, you know, maybe we're drinking alcohol or smoking cigarettes or whatever is going on. We're just constantly bombarding our body with toxins. And so the liver is responsible for breaking down those toxins and helping to excrete them from the body. But if the liver is overburdened because we're, we're, we're exposing ourselves to too many toxins. And on top of that, we're not giving our liver the nutrients that it needs to do its job properly. Then it's not going to do it, do its job properly. So especially with hormonal imbalance, I would say, look, look to the liver and you really want to support the liver. So you can do that with different foods and herbs and teas. Cruciferous vegetables in particular are very helpful for supporting the liver's natural detoxification processes. So cruciferous vegetables include anything that has that like sulfury smell, like Brussels sprouts or broccoli. Um, it also includes things like cauliflower, kale, radishes. Um, there's a whole list you can look up online. There's a whole list of cruciferous veggies, but adding in like a serving or two of those a day could also be helpful, particularly if you have hormonal breakouts, but even if no matter what your breakouts, these foods are very, very healthy. Um, dandelion tea would also be helpful using digestive bitters. I don't know. Have you ever used bitters before? So I actually just received, I ordered from Organic Olivia. You, uh, yes, you know, I knew that. you were going to say that. Yeah, I <laughs> just made ordered it. Bitters cool. Yeah, well, you know what, like, I, I actually never heard of it beforehand. And then I, of course, like a sponsored Instagram ad, this is what always suckers me in the skinny confidential. It was like a clip of her on there. And she called it nature's Ozempic, <laughs> which is absolutely just like a, a play on words it's not a it's not yeah. ozempic in a bottle and don't get excited girls i have used organic olivia before like her para pro like you know the probiotics and like certain things but i'm not gonna lie some of her droppers they taste so nasty i know that they're good for you but like i couldn't commit so a lot of yeah. them just like went past the expiration date and i just ended up throwing them out so i did just get the bitters i it literally just came the other day so i didn't even start it yet i'm a little nervous for how nasty it's gonna taste <laughs> But I am looking forward to trying. Can you explain like to the girls what and yes. actually what those that Yeah, mean? so they do taste nasty. Like I'm not going to lie, like they do not taste good. And the the way that they work is that you need to taste the bitter taste on your tongue because when you taste that, it tells your body to produce digestive enzymes that are going to help you digest your food better. So they're kind of like 
I don't know, a necessary evil, I would say, I guess they're not necessary in the sense that you can get your bitters other than a supplement. So another easy hack is have an arugula salad or a chicory salad at the beginning of your meal that th those are bitter herbs. So they're going to have that similar effect of stimulating digestion uh, without that, like the bitter sprays or the drops like they are like pretty nasty. <laughs> but is it, they is it supposed to make you not want to eat? Like, is that what it's kind of supposed to, <laughs> well, like, I don't know. You not want to eat. No, it's not supposed to make you, maybe Listen, that's what they were calling, calling it, it Ozempic. Yeah, Ozempic. <laughs> Literally, I'm not kidding. They were saying, this is nature's Ozempic. No. And my ears perked up. I'm like, hold on. Maybe I won't <laughs> want to eat my 500 gram bowl of rice after this. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's supposed to just stimulate your digestion so that okay. you digest. And because when you digest your food better, you also absorb your nutrients better as well. So that could be another, you know, issue. Like this is why with acne, like there's really no one size fits all approach, which I think, you know, for any issue, there's no one size fits all approach. You could be eating a healthy diet, but if you're not absorbing the nutrients because you have some gut issues, then you're not getting the nutrients that you need, right? So that's contributing to the problem. So that's why the gut health aspect comes in. But bitters can be really helpful for supporting digestion, for supporting liver health, for um, supporting uh, just detoxification, supporting your body's ability to absorb nutrients. And so for some people, they can be really, really beneficial um, if you can stomach them. Or like I said, you can just try the, the arugula salad or chicory salad before <laughs> meals whenever you can. Yeah, uh, you got me excited. So I'm like, okay, good. I actually started to do that. And I do love an arugula salad. So I want to talk about so that that was all perfect on like what to focus on. I want to talk about the sugar thing again for a second, because I want you to break down a little bit more in more simple terms what foods to avoid when it comes to the sugars that you were mentioning because my I want to know like what are the real tangible telltale signs is it literally looking at the nutrition facts on something and seeing like the sugar percentage seeing the added sugars because that was always mm -hmm. a thing for me was like sometimes sugar is in something but just make sure that where it says added sugars that it says zero percent that was my personal telltale sign but I don't know if that's right or wrong or what you think should, people should really be avoiding when it comes to being addicted to sugar, honestly. Yeah. So we do need like sugar. We do need carbohydrates. Our body runs on carbohydrates. So it's not that we want zero carbohydrates or, or zero sugar. It's that we want to get our carbs and our sugar from whole sources versus okay. refined sources. So that's why I actually prefer looking at the ingredient list first, because that's going to give you like an immediate, of course, looking at the added sugar. So if it says added sugar, then, you know, there's added refined sugar. Um, but when you look at the ingredient list, you'll also be able to see uh, there are so many different names for sugar, cane sugar, beet sugar, high fructose corn syrup, this brown rice syrup, that syrup. There's so many different names for sugar. So you'll be able to see in the ingredient list, it, you know, sometimes there'll be three different types of sugar listed. Uh, and the higher up it is on the ingredient list, like the closer to the front it is, the higher volume that sugar is, or that ingredient is in the particular food. So um, the, the easiest, simplest thing is, and it's not that you again can never have refined sugar. It's just that you want to minimize it and really prioritize the whole foods. So your refined sugar, refined carbohydrates is going to be essentially anything that has refined sugar, like white sugar, or any of the other like sugar syrups or different types of sugar. Um, or that is made with flour. So any sort of baked goods, those are gonna be refined carbohydrates. And the difference between a refined carbohydrate and a whole carbohydrate is that the refined carbohydrates have their most of their fiber and their protein and their nutrients removed from them. So you're essentially getting the sugar. And even if it's not sugar, like let's say it's flour, right? Which is savory. Um, because it's a powder, because it's so like small, uh, our body digests it more quickly. And because of that, it's going to cause a 
increase in our blood sugar and then our insulin is going to cause increase much more rapidly and um, a higher spike than if we were to eat like a whole food. So if we look at like white rice versus brown rice, because brown rice has the outer hull, which has more fiber and protein, it's going to spike your blood sugar less than just white rice. Now, there are a couple hacks which are really important, which I think okay. will help people, you know, <laughs> because listen, I eat white rice. I do eat refined carbohydrates. It's just that I eat them smartly. So I would never, or you, you don't typically want to eat refined carbohydrates on their own. So you don't want to have like a snack of white rice, but if you have, um, you know, a dinner where let's say you have your arugula salad first, so you have your fiber first, and then you have some protein. So let's say you have some, uh, I don't know, beef, garlic, ginger, stir fry, and then you have some rice. Just eating it in that order where you eat your fiber first, then your protein and fat from the, the meat, and then the rice, it actually will help to keep your blood sugar more stable because the fiber is going to coat your intestines and help to prevent the absorption of some of the carbohydrates later on. And also, again, the protein and fat, it just helps to keep your blood sugar more stable. So research shows even if you eat the same exact meal, but you eat it in a different order, if you eat the carbs first and then you eat the fiber and then you eat the, the protein, you'll actually have a higher blood sugar spike. And if wow. anyone's like really interested in kind of hacking their biohacking or, you know, really learning more about their body and experimenting, there are several companies that have continuous glucose monitors that you can order. You slap it on for two weeks and you can actually see in real time how different foods are affecting you and you can do experiments. So I actually did it for two weeks and I did these experiments. So to give you an example, Pineapple, very healthy food. There's so many benefits. It has vitamin C. It has digestive enzymes that help us break down our protein. I ate a cup of pineapple on its own as a snack at like 3 p.m. So in between my meals and it caused a blood sugar spike over, you know, what would be an acceptable level. It was quick, but it did go up. The next day I had the cup of pineapple, but first I had some flax crackers with hummus, I think. So I had some fiber, I had some protein, I had some fat, and then I ate the uh, the pineapple and then my blood sugar stayed in an acceptable range. So it's really interesting when you kind of learn these like little hacks because they actually make a big difference. So you don't have to necessarily change what you're eating, just change the order of what you're eating and that will make a difference. The other wow. hack is just kind of like on that note is when you do want something sweet, Let's say you want dessert. Don't eat it as a snack. Eat it as a dessert. Eat it after your dinner, after your lunch. Eat it after a meal instead of just on its own. Or if you are like, you know what, it's three o'clock. I really want a damn cookie. Have a handful of nuts first and then have the cookie. At least that is going to help to blunt that blood sugar spike a little bit. Wow. That's a, that's a huge hack. I like that. Now I need to like start paying attention because I don't... I don't know the order in which I eat it. I don't know what I'm doing now. So now I'm going to start to pay attention to that. I definitely need to look more into that. That's very cool. Aside from the food, you know, aspect and the nutrition aspect, I also want to discuss probiotics. Tell tell the girls, like, I think everybody probably has experimented with them, taking them, currently taking them, whatnot. How important would you say probiotics are when it comes to really healing the gut? Yeah, I would say they're very important also for our skin health. If you're dealing with any inflammatory skin issue like acne, but also psoriasis, rosacea, anything like that, probiotics can make a big difference. So the research shows there are certain strains that can be beneficial. And we also know that with acne patients in particular, they tend to lack the good lactobacillus and bifidobacteria strains. So in particular, the strains that have been shown to be very helpful for acne prone skin are l Rhamnosus SP1. So this was a double blind placebo controlled trial. Um, they found that when participants supplemented with this particular probiotic for 12 weeks, it improved insulin signaling in the skin and reduced adult acne in that 12 weeks, which is pretty incredible. 
We also know L-acidophilus can be beneficial for skin clarity. And this was actually, remember, I mentioned those two dermatologists that were, you know, experimenting. They used L-acidophilus cultures. Um, so L-acidophilus can be beneficial for skin clarity. Um, bifidum, uh, bifidobacteria strains can also be beneficial because that constipation is or can be an issue with acne in general and hormonal acne. So the bifidobacterium strains um, are helpful for regularity um, and helping with constipation. So I would look for those. And um, you can find probiotics, which are essentially just good bacteria that reside in our gut. We, we do have different microbiomes, um, you know, all over our body, in our, on our, in our mouth, on our skin. Um, the vagina has a, a, its own microbiome. So these are basically good microbes that really help and support various functions in our body. Now you can get them from foods, fermented foods, like sauerkraut and kimchi, tempeh, miso. Um, there are a number of different foods, fermented foods. Fermented foods are not typically a part of the American diet. Maybe sauerkraut on a hot dog or something <laughs> for a ball game, but like they're not, you know, most people are not eating them on a regular basis. So I definitely encourage people to eat them on a regular basis. You want about an ounce a day, but I know that not everybody likes them or they're not always available. Um, and it's not always just very convenient to do so. Um, in which case I also recommend supplementing with probiotics and uh, just choosing a probiotic that has the strains that are going to be beneficial for whatever reason you're taking the probiotics for. So if you're taking it for your skin health, then definitely that L-Rhamnosus SP1, L-Acidophilus, your bifidobacterium strains, those can be helpful. And I mean, I'm so obsessed with probiotics because they really helped me. And I will say, if you were like me and have a very processed food diet, and you've taken antibiotics for a long time, you may find it hard to digest fiber. You may find it really hard to eat broccoli and beans and all those good healthy foods because you get really gassy and bloated and it's uncomfortable. And so it is really important that if that is the case that we are receiving the gut with good bacteria that are gonna help us to digest these healthy foods better and easier without the gas, without the bloating. Um, so I actually started a probiotic company about a year ago called Kuma. And we created our first product, Glow Biome, which is a probiotic formulated specifically for acne prone skin that includes all those um, probiotics I mentioned, plus more to really support skin hydration, to support normal sebum production, to reduce breakouts, um, and then of course, to reduce bloating and support overall gut and digestive health. So I do think that, yeah, probiotics are really, really important because modern life kind of disrupts our gut, like stress disrupts our gut, sugary foods, refined packaged foods disrupt our gut, um, you know, tap water, the chemicals, pesticides in our food, like all of these things are taking a toll on our gut. And so it is really important that we're constantly replenishing our gut with good bacteria. Okay. Okay. First of all, I don't even know how I, I missed that you have your own probiotic. Like, I don't know how I did not see that because I was actually going to ask you which ones you recommend I haven't been on a probiotic in a little while and I need to get back on one so I'm gonna have to go back on your website I don't know how I missed that <laughs> I don't know how yeah. I didn't see that no it's all good I'll send you one <laughs> yeah you know I actually like what happened was I used to take seed and I liked it. I didn't have anything negative about it. But of course it's like expensive and whatnot. So then at some point I just must have stopped my subscription. And then I tried a different probiotic, which was recommended. I don't even remember what it was, but it, it was recommended to me. And I tried it two different times, two different ways, because both times it made me sick. I threw up. So the first time I had it, I can't remember. I can't remember the order in which I had it. I can't remember if I ate it for the, uh, ha took it for the first time on an empty stomach or, on, or after I had just eaten. Whatever I had done that first time when I told somebody oh, it made me throw up. They said, oh, you're supposed to have it the other way around. So maybe they said you're supposed to have it on an empty stomach or you're supposed to have it after eating. So I don't remember the order in which it happened, but then I did it the second time the next day and I threw up again. So I'm like, it kind of scarred me a little bit from probiotics as much as I know they're important. I hate getting sick. So I just was like, let me take a, let me take a minute. Yeah, that's interesting that you had that response. And 
it could be something in that particular probiotic, or maybe it's the coating. I don't know if it was a tablet or if it was like a capsule. Um, it was like a capsule in a capsule. Like you could see the two capsules, I if see. that makes sense. Yeah. So maybe it was just something in there that was not agreeing with you. Sometimes probiotics, like throwing up the probiotic is, is more rare, but sometimes when you start a probiotic, and this is true of any probiotic, it can cause a little bit of digestive upset while your body gets used to it. Like some people will have a little bit of diarrhea for like a couple of days. Um, or some people might have a little bit of increased bloating for a couple of days up to a week or two um, when they first start it. And this could actually be a good sign because it's a sign that the probiotic is active and it's, it's working to actually crowd out and get rid of some of that bad bacteria and mm -hmm. introduce this new bacteria to the party in there. Um, it should subside within a couple of days up to, like I said, like a week or two. Um, and then after that, it should be smooth sailing. But for most people, when you start a probiotic, you should kind of immediately feel better or, or notice a difference within a few days to a few weeks, um, just in terms of like a reduction of bloating, more regularity, just digesting your food better. Sometimes, you know, after you eat, you feel like a brick in your stomach or you just don't feel right. You feel really heavy. Probiotics should work to kind of ease all of those things. So how, when and how are you supposed to be taking a probiotic? Is it supposed to be in the morning, empty stomach, with a meal, after meal? Like when are you supposed to be taking them? It also depends on the, the particular product. So if it has delayed release capsule, then you could technically take it at any time. Um, if it doesn't have a delayed release capsule, then ideally you would take it on an empty stomach um, just to kind of like help it uh, get through as easily and quickly as possible. Um, but if you have a sensitive stomach, then it's definitely better to take it with food. Um, whether it's in a delayed release capsule or not, just because it's going to help uh, prevent any any issues. So usually the package, whatever probiotic you get, will recommend the best for their particular product. Uh, but I would say in terms of timing, whether like morning or evening, there are different schools of thought on that. I think the most important thing is consistency. So if you it's easier for you to take it in the morning, make it a part of your morning routine and do it every morning, like either with or after breakfast or before breakfast. Um, and if it's easier for you to do it in the evening, put it on your nightstand and, uh, you know, make sure you take it every night before bed. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. All right. So to wrap this up, let give us, we want one last juicy thing here. So whether it's one last piece of advice or a myth that you've busted, or just a thing that you wish more people knew about healing acne, give us like your one home run. For anyone listening with acne, the most important thing that you can know is that acne is a blessing in disguise. And I know it doesn't seem that way right now, but it really is because it's your body's way of communicating with you that there's something out of balance. There's some source of, of inflammation inside. And for a lot of people, that inflammation and that imbalance is not necessarily visible on their skin. So they don't find out until much later when it becomes a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. So really use this as a time to really get to know your body better and to try and be on her side. I think like one of the biggest shifts for me was like when I had acne, I hated my skin. Like I was so mad at myself. Like I just thought like I was like in a war basically with myself. But when I realized that the acne was not my body trying to like, you know, ruin my life, but to wake me up, then everything changed. And when I looked at it as more of a blessing than a curse, I realized that um, like I learned how to understand my body better, not just with my skin, but like now I know any symptom I have a headache, a cramp, a this or that, like I know there's some imbalance there. So it, it really taught me to be a body detective and helped me discover a healthier diet and lifestyle. And not only did it improve my skin it improved my immune system and improved my overall health, my mental health, mm -hmm. my mood, all of these things. And so it really is a blessing in disguise. Just be gentle with yourself and give yourself time. And uh, if you can get to the root cause, you can get to the other side of it. There you have it. That was perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. So now tell the girls where they can find you, everything that you have to offer so they can check you out. 
Sure. So you can find me on my website. It's mariamarlo.com and Marlo is spelled M-A-R-L-O-W-E. I have tons of recipes on there, really great blog posts. And that's where you can also find the Clear Skin Plan, which is that 90 day program I talked about. Um, you can find Glow Biome, which is my probiotic. You can also find it on my website, but we have a separate website as well. That's kumaglow.co, which is K-U-M-A-G-L-O-W dot C-O. And then, of course, on social media, I'm pretty active on TikTok, under Glow by Marlo, on YouTube as well, same name. And on Instagram, I'm at Maria Marlo. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you.